Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. We have learned that Senate investigators have obtained new information showing Donald Trump Jr.'s mysterious phone calls ahead of that 2016 Trump Tower meeting were not with his father. This is according to three sources with knowledge of the matter talking to CNN. These are records provided to the Senate Intelligence Committee that show the calls were between Trump Jr. and two of his business associates. And this is significant, Jake, because this new information appears to contradict Democrats' long-held suspicions that the block number was from this candidate Donald Trump and that that would show if it was true that he did have knowledge of the meeting at Trump Tower. So this information came to light recently, Jake, and it could answer one of those key questions. As I said, over the meeting, uh, Trump's eldest son, Don Jr., had set up to get Russian dirt on the Clinton campaign. Trump Jr.'s phone calls involving block numbers have been this lingering issues as investigators have probed the meeting and whether Trump himself had advanced knowledge through any means of that meeting. Now, we should note, Jake, that Don Jr.'s attorney did not provide a comment for our story. All right. So uh, there you have it. Somebody at the Senate Intelligence Committee is leaking to the press because, you know, damn well, it did not come from Robert Mueller. Mueller does not leak. And the, somebody on the Senate Intel Committee is leaking to CNN, who had this story exclusively yesterday afternoon, uh, that Donald Trump Jr.'s blocked phone number phone calls uh, ahead of the Moscow Trump Tower meeting and post right after the Trump Tower meeting with indicted Natalia Veselnitskaya, uh, somehow exonerates Donald Trump Jr. from having the meeting with the uh, indicted Natalia Veselnitskaya at Trump Tower after Rob Goldstone, who's representing another developer in Russia, the Agararars, who happened to have a son named Emin, who has a publicist because he thinks he's a pop star, uh, contacts Trump and says that the Russian government is all in for Donald Trump and as part of their effort to help Donald Trump win, they will give dirt on Hillary Clinton through Donald Trump Jr. if he can arrange a meeting. Seriously, somehow this exonerates Donald Trump Jr.? Somehow this does? Now, what's important is... Donald Trump Jr.'s testimony to the Senate Intelligence Committee when he was asked who, who was that block number, who did you call, he said, I don't recall. How definitive? Well, it turns out that the leak, whoever's leaking at the Senate Intel Committee, says that the phone records show that the calls to block numbers that came on June 6th, now the meeting was the 9th, that came on June 6th, saying they had dirt on Hillary Clinton, to which Junior responds, oh, I love it. I, you know, if, you, if it is what you say it is, I absolutely love it. And also follows uh, June 7th, two days before the Trump Tower meeting with indicted Russian spy Natalia Veselnitskaya. Trump has, uh, you know, he's just won a bunch of primaries and he uh, gives a speech and this is what he says. Secretary Clinton even did all of the work on a totally illegal private server. Something that how she's getting away with this, folks, nobody understands. Designed to keep her corrupt dealings out of the public record, putting the security of the entire country at risk, and a president in a corrupt system is totally protecting her. Not <laughs> right. I am going to give a major speech on probably Monday of next week, and we're going to be discussing all of the things that have taken place with the Clintons. I think you're going to find it very informative and very, very interesting. Okay, so phone calls and emails and text messages are going back and forth between Junior and the Crocus Group, uh, you know, founder, uh, 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 the Agarilars, uh, Ar you know, and, and his son Emin and his publicist Rob Goldstone to arrange for a meeting to give dirt to Junior for his dad's campaign on behalf of the Russian government. Now, we're led to believe that, the, uh, that the, the, the blocked phone numbers belong to the CEO of NASCAR, 
Brian France and a real estate developer named Howard Lorber, who happens to own one of the biggest real estate, uh, you know, companies in Manhattan. In fact, when I, uh, you know, moved from Florida to uh, Manhattan in order to work for Air America, I needed a real estate lady to help me find a rental. I couldn't buy anything. No one could buy anything. I mean, how do you buy anything unless you're a Russian oligarch? And the company that helped me was Howard Lorber's company. It's called Douglas Elliman. It's a huge real estate company. And as it turns out, Howard Lorber was the person who took Donald Trump to Russia in the first place to help him build a Trump Tower Moscow. So somehow this exonerates, uh, you know, uh, listen, this is a leak, and this is a leak from the Senate Intelligence Committee. I don't know who gave this to the press. I'm not sure. CNN, they're great reporters, and wherever the news breaks, that's what they, uh, you know, deliver. Obviously, uh, you know, they, they've they been called fake, and but all of a sudden Trump loves them, and Trump loves the New York Times because he reached out to the publisher of the New York Times, Mr. Schulzberger, and invited him for an off-the-record interview, which Mr. Schulzberger said, no, uh, we would like two of our reporters in attendance. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I ate before the show. See, this is why you don't eat before the show. Um, that's disgusting. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's human. What could I tell you? And uh, so Maggie Haberman, Salzberger, they went to the White House. They tape recorded the interview. And Donald Trump told an enormous amount of lies in that interview. And one of the lies had to do with Russia, where he said he was told by Rod, <laughs> Rod Rosenstein, that he's not a target of the Mueller investigation. Now, again, words matter. Target means that uh, Mueller would, would be ready to indict a person. And if it's true that Mueller doesn't think that Trump is indictable because of his uh, you know, verified position as president of the United States, then he can't be a target. Could be a subject of interest, a person of interest. Uh, but he says he's not a target. We don't know if that's true or not because Trump has lied about so much in just, uh, you know, the past few days. He keeps telling us today, he told us again, that the threat that we face is the southern border. He keeps telling us that his intel uh, people that testified clearly testified that the biggest threats to the United States have nothing to do with the southern border. He says that they uh, were mischaracterized in their 42-paged written report, which is included in the homework today. So go to RandyRhodes.com and click on homework if you're not a subscriber. If you are a subscriber to the homework, which is free, uh, then you have it in the homework section delivered lovingly to your mailbox for free every single day, courtesy of us. Uh, and in the homework, you will see the 42-page written report that clearly does not mention the southern border until about page 30, okay? It puts uh, the, the threats in the order of the threat level, and it does not, it says Iran is complying with the uh, nonproliferation agreement, even though the United States pulled out because it's being enforced by European capitals, and Iran is not taking steps to build nuclear weapons. However, North Korea is, and Donald Trump is very busy tweeting, there's no more threat from North Korea, no nuclear threat from North Korea, and they countered him. They said, uh, they contradicted him and said, uh, that's not true. I, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing thing. And you know, yesterday when he was asked about the Intel chief's testimony, which was broadcast on many networks, wall to wall, full throttle, the whole thing, unedited, which comes with a written report as well, 42 pages, which you can read for your own damn self if you'd like, uh, which is in the homework section at randyroads.com. He said that the Intel chiefs, and we're talking about, you know, uh, Dan Coates, we're talking about the uh, cyber, uh, the, NS, the chief of the NSA, you know, uh, cyber security, uh, Paul Macassoni, we're talking about um, the, D, D, the DNI, we're talking, that's uh, Dan Coates, we're talking about the D DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency Director, General Robert Ashley, we're talking about the Geospatial Intelligence Agency Director, Robert Cardillo, they all testified. 
he says they all told him the media created fake news. The media is, is responsible. He said, quote, they were totally misquoted and they were totally, it was taken out of context. I'd suggest that you call them. They said it was fake news, which frankly doesn't surprise me. That's Mr. President, did you talk to your intelligence chiefs today about the displeasure you had with their testimony? I did, the and they uh, said that they were totally misquoted and they were totally, uh, it was taken out of context. So what I do is I'd suggest that you call them. Uh, they said it was fake news, so which frankly well, we didn't just surprise ran exactly me. what me. they said to Congress. Excuse me. It didn't surprise me at all. But we're here to talk right now about China. About China. Uh, here's some of their testimony. We currently assess that North Korea will seek to retain its WMD capabilities and is unlikely to completely give up its nuclear weapons and production capabilities. Is it the IC's assessment that this country's adversaries continue to use U.S. social media platforms as a vehicle for weaponizing disinformation and spreading foreign influence in the United States? Director Ray? Uh, yes, that's certainly the FBI's assessment, not only of the Russians uh, continued to do it in 2018, but we've seen indication that they're continuing to adapt their model and that other countries are taking a very interested eye in that approach. Is Iran currently abiding by the, the terms of the JCPOA in terms of their nuclear activities? Yes, they're, they're making some preparations that would increase um, their ability to take a step back if they make that decision. So at the moment, technically, they're in compliance. While ISIS is nearing territorial defeat in Iraq and Syria, the group has returned to its guerrilla warfare roots while continuing to plot attacks and direct its supporters worldwide. ISIS is intent on resurging and still commands thousands of fighters in Iraq and Syria. So now, now you know, uh, Trump says that they told him that their testimony has been totally mischaracterized. You know what it is, everybody? You know what it is? It just, it comes through the TV cameras in a 180. See, the cameras are like refracting. They're taking the, the story and they're, th when you get it, it's, it doesn't agree with Trump, but they meant to. It's the TV cameras that are distorting. Oh my God. You know what it is? Trump goes over it enough times in his mind that he's confident that what he thinks happened actually happened. He never makes up his mind. He makes things up in his mind is what it is. On the other side of the break, now that we've exposed him as a great liar, we're going to talk about uh, Mr. Lorber and these uh, block number phone calls with Craig Unger. Speaking truth to power, The Randy Rhodes Show. The block numbers, I'm happy it leaked. I'm happy it came out because the suggestion was the block numbers were the president. People were using it as a potential smoking gun. It was on TV all the time with pundits yeah. uh, getting ready to cash in on it. They were wrong. It wasn't the president. However, now we expect Don Jr. to jump up and down. Uh, but for people to say, well, that ends that, doesn't end it for me. Does it end it for you? <laughs> No, it doesn't. I mean, I, I, frankly, Chris, for me, this uh, uh, hyperventilating about those phone call, that phone call is uh, kind of uh, uh, a little overwrought, in my opinion. Uh, and the fact that it apparently wasn't to uh, uh, the president uh, or the candidate at the time, um, you know, I, I don't think it, it has that much bearing on... Right. Uh, Just because it wasn't him doesn't mean he didn't know. Is, was the, was the president aware right. of the meeting, whether he heard about it via this phone call or not? And, you know, what, what is his complicity here? Mm -hmm. That, to me, is, is, is a much bigger issue. Yeah, it is. It's a huge issue because, obviously, Donald Trump knew something, uh, some dirt was going to be exchanged because on June 6th, the phone call was placed. And then on June 7th, Donald Trump stood in front of a group of uh, reporters and said that on Monday, the meeting was two days later, on Monday, that was like a Thursday, uh, the meeting, uh, I will have dirt on Hillary Clinton. I will have dirt on her. 
So was he aware of the meeting? Well, we know he lied to cover for Donald Trump Jr. post-meeting. We know he dictated a letter to Whole Picks that was a complete BS uh, letter saying that the meeting that Jr. held in uh, Trump Tower with the indicted Natalia Veselnitskaya Russian spy uh, was... Uh, about adoptions and that that was untrue. So, of course, he knew about the meeting. But I was looking on Twitter, you know, and uh, some of the authors that have written fabulous, fabulous books about Donald Trump's history with uh, various uh, organized, uh, you know, uh, people. Um, you know, there's there's great books out there. And Craig Unger wrote one of the better ones. He wrote uh, House of Trump, House of Putin. And he was tweeting like a madman this morning. Uh, and so I direct messaged him, which freaked him out. It freaked him out. He's like, please, please don't do that. It drives me crazy. I'm so sorry. But um, he accepted our invitation and <laughs> and he's here. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was just saying that uh, if I have to keep my Twitter news alerts on to get yeah. DMs, uh, it goes crazy. I know? know. I know exactly what you're talking about. I get it, too. I have to turn it off because it's just so overwhelming. But... I saw you tweeting, and I was like, ooh, let me see if he's still there. And I DM'd you, and you were great. You were just absolutely great. So here's one of your tweets, and, and I want to discuss with you. You wrote a whole thread, and, it was, and it's a thread that's been going on for, like, weeks now. But today, uh, or yesterday, it, it was fascinating, that blocked number phone call, circa 2016 Trump Tower meeting, went to real estate developer Howard Lorber, who was much more than just a family friend. In 96, when Trump went to Russia to try to develop Trump Tower Moscow, Lorber came with his partner, Bennett LeBeau. Now, there's more to this thread, but I'll let you explain how Howard Lorber. <clears throat> right. Well, uh, Lorber and Below were powerful and rich uh, real estate developers, and they got involved in Russia in the early 90s when you... There was no choice but to get involved with the Russian mafia. The Russian mobsters, you know, when when the Soviet Union crumbled, the only people who had money uh, were mobsters. And they had to be because essentially all of free enterprise was illegal back then. And Lorber and Bennett LeBeau were early on the scene then. And uh, what was fascinating to me about the timing of that was that uh, uh, LeBeau's— the, the, one of the, their friends was a guy, uh, a Russian named Vadim Rabinovich, and he had been he was with them, and he had just taken part in uh, in a meeting in Tel Aviv that was very very famous. If you follow the Russian mafia, and at that meeting in 1995, uh, my favorite Russian mobster, a guy named Semyon Mogilevich, who's sort of the financial genius behind the Russian mafia was given control of the Ukraine energy trade. The Ukraine energy trade is enormously lucrative, and uh, Mogilevich set up deals that allowed him to skim uh, essentially about $750 million a year off the top. Wow. All right, so let's just uh, let's just pause and explain. Mogilevich was called the Brainy Don. He was the uh, big brain behind, uh, you know, uh, money and Russian mafia, etc. And he was in the energy business in Ukraine. Would he have any, you know, relations with, let's say, a Manafort? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, I mean, this is, you know, the, one of the old uh, lessons we learned from Watergate, of course, is follow the money. Mm -hmm. And where does the money come from? And a lot of it is siphoned off. Uh, is that $750 million that's siphoned off uh, from the Ukraine energy trade? And that kind of deal needs um, the approval of Vladimir Putin. So, These are. This is why we call Russia a mafia state. And yes, is the answer to uh, to uh, Manafort's involvement. So this is why Manafort would want to promote a uh, Russia friendly dictator, essentially Viktor Yanukovych, to be the president of Ukraine while Putin and his mafia friends are heavily invested in Ukraine's energy business. Right. Absolutely. And, and what we, you know, I, I think a lot of that needs to be unpacked for a lot of people because everyone may hear that uh, Manafort's working in Ukraine. And I think most Americans 
don't know that much about Ukraine or what it, what it means, but it means he is working for Vladimir Putin. Uh, Ukraine, by the way, is the largest country in Europe. Uh, it's, it's a very, very big country, and Putin wants it back. And, and we've seen one after one all the East Bloc nations joined uh, NATO, and Putin is saying, no, Ukraine is, is the last straw. That is not going to happen. And he wanted to protect that. So he brings in Paul Manafort to help install uh, Yanukovych as president, a very pro-Putin man as president of Ukraine, to solidify the kind of arrangement we're talking about. Right. And it turns out in the end uh, that, uh, you know, Manafort has this media plan and he's got this way of uh, propping up Yanukovych as a good guy. And in the end, the people of Ukraine realize Yanukovych is a Putin uh, extension and he's also an oligarch and he's, uh, you know, a mafia guy and they run him out of town. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he goes back to Russia. Right, right. Now, what's interesting uh, but, to but me... But Putin wants to do the same with the United States. And, he, and again, he is Manafort, install a pro-Putin president, but as president of the United States. Okay, and and so uh, not to get off track, I just want to stop here for a second and tell my audience that in our timeline uh, of what happened the day of the June 9th Moscow uh, meeting in Trump Tower, that morning, and this never really gets talked about, but that morning, Donald Trump and Paul Manafort are together at the Four Seasons in Manhattan. And Manafort leaves, uh, Trump leaves first, Manafort leaves later, and goes directly from the Four Seasons to the Trump Tower Moscow meeting. Just saying. Okay. So the block, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, people forget that little detail. And then uh, the next, you know, uh, uh, right after that, we had the Pulse nightclub shooting. So Donald Trump does not give the dirt on Hillary Clinton until the 22nd. But here's a question nobody ever can answer. And we're going to have to find out later, I guess, with Mueller. Uh, how does Trump even know that Hillary deleted any emails, let alone the exact number, 33,000? How does he know this? Right. Well, we don't know every bit of the answer, right. but we, we, we do know that Roger Stone... Uh, seems to have a direct line to WikiLeaks. It's interesting. Uh, that, you know, so, so there, there's quite a few possibilities there of the way the information could be transmitted. All right. So now let's go back to your book. Let's go back to uh, the Trump Tower Moscow. Uh, early, uh, early on in the 90s, uh, you know, How, Howard Lorber, who is now the chairman of Douglas Elliman, which was my real estate. <laughs> that was my real estate. You know. <laughs> Really, when I moved yes. when I moved to Manhattan, and, yeah, when I moved to Manhattan, it, they 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 uh, yeah, they helped me uh, rent my apartment on Park Avenue. But anyway, okay, so he's show, Donald Trump is taken to Moscow uh, by Howard Lorber and Howard Lorber's partner, Mr. LeBeau. Mr. LeBeau has been in a a meeting in Tel Aviv uh, talking to a Russian mobster named Mog Moglevich, right? Mo uh, Mo Moglevich. Uh, I, I, I say Mugulevich, but I, I don't even, I, you know, right, I, know. I we, don't speak Russian. And I don't I'm either. doing the best I can. I know, and that's why my Ukrainian heritage doesn't count, because whenever I say I'm Ukrainian, people go, oh, do you speak Russian? No, then you're not from there. Okay, great. But anyway, uh, so he they're, they're in this meeting in Tel Aviv with this big, giant, brainy Russian, head of the Russian mob, uh, Moglevich. And then, in an effort to develop the Trump Tower... They're shown around Moscow by the mayor of Moscow, a guy named Yuri Luzkov, who's close to Moglevich, and to another guy named Ivankov. Now, Ivankov well, is what, a murderer? What is he? Uh, he has killed a lot of people ah. in the FBI. He, and, and Moglevich has sent him to the United States. He, he was sort of driven. Uh, the Russian mafia wanted to get him out of Russia because he was such a wild man. He was just killing so many people. And this was at a time they, they when Mogilevich really wanted to put discipline into the Russian mafia in New York. So he sent over Mogilevich. Uh, and uh, after a while, the FBI was looking all over Brooklyn. I mean, the, the Russian mafia in general uh, was based in Brighton, in Brooklyn. Here, Brighton Beach. In Brighton Beach, yeah. which is part of Brooklyn. I know. I'm and in from fact, there. one of their one of their headquarters was a restaurant called El Karib. And who do you think owned that? Michael Cohen's family. 
Ah, so this is why Trump is saying, look at Michael Cohen's uh, father-in-law. Is this why? Right. His, his, both Michael Cohn and his brother Brian married Ukrainian women. Mm -hmm. And their fathers-in-law uh, were tied up with the, the, uh, the ethanol industry, which was another, another kind of oligarch. So, and, and by the way, M Michael Cohn, uh, Michael Cohn's wife, uh, Laura Schusterman, uh, was friends with Felix Sater back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So this goes back more than 30 years. And, it, you know, I guess you could say there's a coincidence, but there are an awful lot of coincidences here. And you see the Russian mafia cropping up again and again and again. One of the, and when, uh, when the FBI was chasing uh, Ivan Kov all over uh, Brooklyn and looking for him in Brooklyn, they finally found out where he lived, and it was 721 Fifth Avenue, Trump Tower. Oh, isn't that small world stuff? Oh, it's such a it, small world. Oh, it, it really is because in, in you know as, as I write in the book, in 1984, Trump was actually present when another member of Mogilevich's gang, a guy named David Bogatin, just walked in, put down six million dollars in cash. That's the equivalent of about 15 million today. And said, "I'll take five condos." Yeah, and I just wonder if 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 Howard Lorber's real estate company that showed me my apartment showed any apartments in Trump Tower to any of these people who paid cash for these apartments. I just wonder if perhaps that company, you know, had agents that uh, you know were interested in a cash deal. Right. Well, the the real is. I mean, one of the <laughs> huge problems in all of this is. Uh, uh, part, a big, big part of the scandal is legal. And right. real estate regulations are so lax that it would be in the interest of a real estate broker or a seller like Donald Trump to not ask any questions and say, OK, I'll take the $15 million or $6 million or whatever it is, and not ask, oh, did, where did you get it? Right. And, and what, when you're looking at money laundering, you're, you're sort of, there's sort of two tri criteria that tip people off. One is buying a company with an anonymous shell company, yeah, and the other is all-cash purchases. And Trump, uh, 1,300 Trump condos have been sold that fit the, those criteria in the United States alone, and he's got again as many holdings outside the United States. Okay, so Trump Tower is, uh, you know, actually open for business and selling condos and stuff like that in 1984 because, you know, well, it was built in 1984. And the Russian mafia almost immediately start laundering money through Trump real estate for the first time around then. Uh, you've got a guy named Oleg Kalugin who was a former head of counterintelligence for the KGB. And did he ever tell you anything about uh, that being the time when the intelligence operations on the Russian side began regarding Donald Trump and maybe his willingness to launder Russian oligarchs' money? Right. Well, you, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence, and this is part of it, that Trump was actually compromised um, by 1987. And just consider this. he We know that he was uh, laundering money as early as 1984 for the Russian mafia. Mm -hmm. We also know, as General Kalugin told me, that the Russian mafia, very, very unlike the American uh, Italian-American mafia, is a state actor. Right. It is part of the KGB, effectively. They work at the KGB's pleasure and shares information. So the KGB would have known that Trump, uh, was laundering money, and he was open to that kind of thing, that he was uh, compromisable, that his ethics were not exactly stellar. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, Trump's first wife, Ivana, was from Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. And we know that the Czech Secret Service, the, the, the STB, uh, was spying on her family in Czechoslovakia, and they were sharing that information with the KGB. We also didn't know they took it seriously enough that they sent over a spy to New York to keep an eye on Trump, and that that spy reported to the KGB. Um, so we know all that happened, and then in 1986, another phase starts, and um, uh, the ambassador, Yuri uh, Gubinin, uh, who is ambas Soviet ambassador 
to the United Nations at the time. And remember, this is still the Soviet Union. It's before the fall of the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, Putin is just a, a, a KGB guy in Dresden, Germany. Colonel. But, but I'm sorry? A colonel. A colonel, yeah. Um, so um, they... Uh, uh, they sort of keep an eye on Trump, and, and they uh, and they go actually go into Trump Tower without a uh, uh, without a advance warning, and they start flattering him shamelessly. Mm. This is Ambassador Dubinin and his daughter Natalia Dubinin, who is with the Russian consulate in New York, and is said to have had KGB ties as well. And they say Trump Tower is so marvelous, you got to do one in Moscow. And this is the beginning of the Trump Tower Moscow. 1986, they invite Donald Trump to Moscow. They give him an all-expense-paid trip, uh, and he could have afforded it himself, I think, by then. And then uh, they, uh, while he is there, uh, General Kalugin told me he was. Uh, they, they brought Trump women, and there may well have been. Uh, uh, compromise, video, yeah, video compromise of sex, 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 um, and uh, Kalugin said he was he was sh sure that that had happened. Huh. So that's m maybe where the tape that everybody uh, you know uh, opines about uh, <coughs> I, came from from I, 1987. You know, which... you know, I've heard of, of multiple reports. The 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 one in the steel dossier took place later. This is not that that same tape, but it's possible it happened oh, that's right. that's on right. different occasions. That's right, because uh, this one was to celebrate uh, peeing on the bed that Obama slept in. Right, you're right. Right. Oh, okay, so let's fast forward. Wow. I think Obama was in high school back then. Or right, right, right. 87, sure. Yeah, yeah, he was a, he was a child. But, uh, yeah, okay, so now let's fast forward to 2013. So Trump is still trying to build this stupid tower in Moscow. And instead now he's turning to another uh, real estate oligarch, a mogul. This one is uh, uh, in Russia. His name's Aris Agararilov. Again, another person whose name is Agalarov. Yeah. Agalarov. And his son, Emin, thinks he's a pop star. So, of course, he has a publicist, right? And Trump appears in one of Emin's videos and da 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 So they know each other. And it is through Rob, the PR guy, that this meeting in Trump Tower is set up, right? But isn't it true that Aris, who's head of the Crocus Group, which is exactly uh, where, you know, it was in one of their theaters that the universe, Miss Universe pageant was held. It was in uh, Agararilov's, uh, you know, uh, uh, theater. Uh, isn't it true that he is also tied to the brainy Don Mog Mogilevich? Yes, it is. Um, and this is one thing in, the, in my in House of Trump that I write about that I, I think I'm the only person to have, mm -hmm. have covered. And this is in February 2013. And uh, Mogilevich is giving a birthday party to Sergei Mikhailov, who is the who is truly the head of the, the, the biggest uh, crime family in the Russian ma mafia, the <laughs> Kolsevo gang. And uh, and they they have been longtime criminal associates. There, uh, Mogilevich is the brains behind it, and in, in terms of the financial wizard. But Mikhailov is the most powerful person, and his fifty fifth birthday. And there are about thirty five people there, so this is an intimate affair. Everyone who's invited is a longtime associate of the Russian mafia. Uh, and uh, like all mafias, there's always a singer an entertainer who is sort of the mafia's favorite. And in the United States, it was Frank Sinatra. I was going to say. if you saw the God, Godfather I, movie, it's yes. played by Al Martino. And yes. it, it, it's sort of Johnny Fontaine is the character's name. Uh -huh. Well, the Russians had a guy for many, many years who just died named Yosef Kobzon. And he had entertained at all their gatherings for years. But this time he is pushed aside and they use a young pop star named Amin Aguilera. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting, I'm told, there were two Americans who were there representing Donald Trump. And uh, I've not definitive. I think I know who they are, but I've not definitively identified them. So I unfortunately, I can't say. Really? Can you give me a hint? Um, <laughs> well, um, rhymes with body a baby. Well, I, you know. <laughs> um, I, well, 
I will tell you later. All right. Okay. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it, it, Felix Hader has denied that he was there. One source told me he was. Felix has denied it to me when I when I talked to him. Okay. Now, Felix, Felix is a very interesting character in that Felix, you know, obviously was mobbed up early on in his life. Uh, Felix's dad was a, a mobster, a Russian uh, mobster. And uh, that's how Felix was raised. Now, Michael Cohen and Felix Sater, for those of you who forget, they've been best friends since junior high school in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. OK, and you know that I know something about this Ukrainian community, Brighton Beach, Brooklyn, because I'm from there. OK, and so... Uh, Felix obviously gets in trouble, Russian mafia, pump and dump stock scheme, et cetera, et cetera. And now he is apparently a cooperator and works with the FBI, but he positions himself as Trump's senior advisor at Trump Tower. He's got the business card and the whole nine yards. Um, he's also had some very interesting background with regard to having Osama bin Laden's phone number and helping our intelligence people do a lot of. And so you kind of want to believe that Felix Sater is a good guy at the, you know, in this part, part of his life. Uh, we don't hear much about him. He did a quick. Do you remember when he did like his media tour? He was all over TV for a free, for a few minutes. And he was uh, interviewed by everybody. I mean, Chris Cuomo interviewed him and, and uh, you know, uh, MSNBC interviewed him. There were a lot of interviews with him. And then he went away. It's supposedly, uh, Felix Sater is supposed to be cooperating with the FBI now. And if he is, couldn't, couldn't he make all these ties that we're discussing here? Well, absolutely. In fact, I, I, we know that he was going back and forth from New York to Moscow. He speaks Russian. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I, I found some of the companies he was meeting with, and one of them is Sistema, uh, which was tied to uh, Mogilevich again. And that's Mogilevich. Sistema, for those of you, uh, is Mogil M Mogilevich, the brainy don. That is his real estate company. Crocus Group is it, the Agarola. He doesn't own it, but it is is. Uh, there are ties uh, between the principals there and him okay. that are pretty close. So basically what we're saying to you is here, me and uh, Craig Unger, author of uh, House of Trump, House of Putin, is that almost everybody that Trump knows from Russia is a Russian mafioso type, either a Don or at least a Capo, with ties to real estate, with ties to real estate people here in the United States. It's a two-way street. So that you have Howard, uh, Howard Lorber, you've got his partner, LeBeau, you've got Mogilevich with a real estate empire, you've got the Agararlovs, who are also tied to Mogilevich with a real estate empire called the Crocus Group, and you've got the Trump Organization. Isn't that something? Yeah, you know, it, it's amazing. When, when, think of it this way: that one is he, the, the president of the United States has had a 35-year relationship with loads and loads of people in the Russian mafia, <laughs> and they are tied to Russian intelligence. Many of them have lived. Uh, they, he has laundered money for them, probably in the billions of dollars over the years. Mm -hmm. Even so, he ended up four billion dollars in debt after he expanded into Atlantic City. And who came to his aid but the Russian mafia again? And it was people like Felix Sater in uh, a real estate company called Bayrock right. that was based in Trump Tower on the 24th floor. And they raised money from groups like the FL Group, which is an Icelandic company that's been known to launder money for the Russian mafia. Um, you know what's also interesting, and I, I don't, I don't know how deeply uh, you've explored this little area, but you might want to do it. Um, it. It always stunned me that Wilbur Ross is our Secretary of Commerce, and uh, that he falls asleep in meetings, and that he said the other day, you know, that uh, you know the people that are going without pay, they need to take a loan, you know, to get through the bad time. I mean, it was just sick. But anyway, this guy, uh, you know, Wilbur Ross, he was the Vice Chair of the Bank of Cyprus. At the same time, the other vice chair was a Russian, and he remained the vice uh, chair of the Bank of Cyprus right until the day he was sworn in as our commerce secretary. I always found that fascinating. Right, and, and the Bank of Cyrus is, Cyprus is, is known for laundering Russian money. I know. Isn't that something, too? Such a small but, world, Craig Unger. So small it is. Just a little more. And are these all coincidences? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to put this in a macro view for a minute, uh, since Putin has been president, over a trillion, there's been over $1 trillion in flight capital 
from Russia. Wow. That money needs to be laundered if the oligarchs are to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. It's a so, you know, it sets up this situation where they want to find a fast means. Uh, what's the best way to launder vast amounts of money? And real estate is certainly part of it. Oh, well, um, what a better way is there if there's no rules about anonymously owned shell companies paying cash for apartments in the United States of America? No citizenship requirements, no background checks. I mean, if I wanted to move into a co-op, they would they would go through, you know, like uh, every purchase I made at Walmart to see, you know what I mean? They would look at every credit card, every tax return. Every, but for some reason, if you have cash and you're a Russian... You know, real estate is, uh, is, is uh, you know, there's no rules. Right, right. No, it, 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 it's true. And, you know, a huge part of the scandal here, I think, is, and this is one reason we're not going to get, whatever Mueller comes up with, it won't be the entire story. And one reason is he has to do indictments. He has to prosecute. He has to get conviction. And a huge part of this is what's legal. So, in real estate, it's very hard to convict someone if they just say, oh, I don't know. The guy said he wanted to buy my condo for $5 million. Yeah. I didn't know where the money came from. Right. Yeah. And, and you can see that kind of corruption in the legal world. The big, big white shoe Washington law firms uh, like Jones Day or, or Kirkland Ellis, uh, they have a huge number of Russian oligarchs as clients who are paying them millions and millions of dollars. And that's perfectly legal. Yeah. The Russians also studied the K Street lobbying system, which essentially is a legalized form of bribery, really. It's unbelievable. And, and you know, when I saw the, the, the really crazy moment, the really, really sick moment and, and, and of, of all these moments, you know, where obviously Trump was asking Russia for help. And obviously he knew that Hillary Clinton had deleted emails right after Junior makes contact in Trump Tower with the Russians. That's when he starts asking for her deleted emails. It's so interesting that that's when he is told she has emails. Uh, we can see them. We would, we, you know, and, and Trump is like, uh, you know, Russia, if you're listening, I want those emails. And that day they begin to hack her personal email uh, account to get them for him. I mean, all that is very stunning and shocking, but the really, really sick part of it, the really crazy part, happened when uh, Jamal Khashoggi was killed, okay? The Saudis killed Jamal Khashoggi in the, the embassy in Turkey, and Vlad and this new king high-five each other because they've gotten Donald Trump to look the other way. Absolutely. And, and it, I mean, it, it, the role of Jared Kushner and all that is quite interesting because at the time, Kushner had vastly overpaid uh, for uh, a property on Park Avenue here, 666 Park Avenue. And he paid nearly $2 billion for it, which was much more than it's worth. So he ended up hundreds of millions of dollars in debt and he desperately needed some money and started meeting with Mohammed bin Salman the crown prince and really the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, uh, cozying up to him in hopes of getting loans from a Saudi finance bank. Meanwhile, Jared had access to the presidential daily briefings. He had, uh, he, uh, and, and he, so he had, and this included highly classified information intelligence on the internal politics of the Saudi royal family. Who was, who were the big enemies? of MBS and who they were se were secretly plotting against them. Mm -hmm. And among those people was the journalist, Jamal Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. So what the real question is, was Jared sharing this information with, with MBS? Was he effectively delivering a hit list to MBS while he's trying to get uh, a few hundred million dollars in loans with MBS's approval. Yeah, we've told that story, too, that he was trading. We, we suspect that he was trading uh, information in the presidential daily brief about the people who would not be um, open to uh, bin uh, Salman taking control of Saudi Arabia because he broke the order of succession and he came from nowhere. Uh, and uh, so maybe Jared uh, gave him the presidential daily briefing list of the people that were opposed to him, uh, you know, coming out of order into, uh, you know, the main role of the ruler. 
And, and that was an exchange for, you know, uh, bailing him out of this 666, which is aptly numbered, uh, apartment building. Uh, you know, and then so then you have this meeting between Putin and a meeting between uh, uh, bin Salman. And in public, they high five after Donald Trump says uh, to journalists that murdered dissidents and anybody else critical of Putin isn't a problem because, quote, it's not in our country. Even though, right. even though Jamal Khashoggi uh, was a green card holder in the United States and wrote columns for the Washington Post. I just find this right. all, it's so coincidental that Jared is also in the real estate business. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. Well, listen, Craig, thanks for uh, taking my uh, DM. I will ne never do that again. I now have yourself. No, no, no. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, I just didn't, uh, you know, I knew it's, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking polar vortex. I know where you, you know, I, I don't want to say I know where you live because that sounds like a horror movie, but I know that you live in Manhattan. Uh, downtown, and I know it comes to a full screeching halt with the Paul Vorta, and so I figured you were sitting there, so I took a chance. <laughs> okay. I'm, also, I'm glad also, you got me. I, I'm glad I got you too, but also I have to say that uh, this was by request. I mean, I was reading your tweets, and I was tweeting my own thing, and people were tweeting me back, and they were saying to me, you should have Craig Unger on the show. I said, well, I can do that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, so it was by request. So thank you so much. You've made my listeners extraordinarily happy. The book is unbelievable. It's so good. It's called House of Trump, House of Putin. And you know he's written other ones uh, about George Bush and, you know, uh, House of Saud. But it's all, it's always these uh, dictators that, uh, you know, the billionaire class uh, seem to want to hang with. You know, they, they just, right. it's just so weird. It's just so strange. And, you know, in Davos, uh, you had this... Um, I don't know if you saw this video. This one went uh, viral, too. It was a, a, a Dutch historian. He went to Davos for the first time, and he was sitting there, and he was talking about uh, the income inequality and how, you know, a very, uh, like, the, 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 uh, like 2,200 people or even less own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire world's population put together. And he was talking about taxes being, you know, a way that they evade uh, their paying their fair share. And this is why we have such uh, rampant in inequality. And, you know, you had this uh, other billionaire stand up. Of course, the billionaires are against the billionaire tax and trash them and say, why are you? you this is so one sided. Stop talking about taxing the billionaires. And you had this wonderful woman from Oxfam. Uh, respond to him. I'm going to play that for for our audience uh, when we come back. But it's all about this. It's all about corruption, and it's all about money laundering, and it's all about avoiding taxes, and it's all about avoiding a system where everyone's nickels and shekels and petrodollars are accountable. You know, I mean, billionaires will always seek to protect their billions. They will break the law. They will break your legs. They will break heads. They will throw people out of windows. And these are Donald Trump's best friends. Right. This is truly an age of kleptocracy. Yeah. And we, we saw uh, Putin bring it to Russia, and now Trump is, is, is doing it here. Yeah. Well, Yeltsin started it, you got to admit, and then it just uh, went on and on. Yeltsin handed it over because he was too drunk. He was too drunk. So we handed it over to uh, the colonel in the KGB. That's how we got Putin, and people don't know that. And Putin is hell-bent on rebuilding the old... Uh, USSR. He wants the Soviet Union back in play. And he's moving into other hemispheres. I mean, he's in Venezuela. He just, for a billion and a half dollars, this man just bought Venezuelan's oil fields. And now he he owns three refineries because of this. In in the On the Gulf Coast, he owns three ref Sitco refineries now. I mean, these guys are moving in. Yeah. And it, can, it, it, and it could only happen with a, with a corrupt guy like Trump. It, that's the only way that this country could ever be destroyed is from within. And they've been cultivating this man, as your book clearly shows, since the early middle 80s. OK, and by 87, he had gone. To, he's been to Russia, what, six, seven times already? Right, right. I mean, I, I think people have to wake up because this is not just I, I hate the term meddling. Meddling is sort of what mm -hmm. you're in-laws do with your marriage. That's right. You know what I mean? Yes. This is this is an assault on America's sovereignty. Right. This is a global conflict. It's happening just, not just to us, but in the UK it was Brexit, and it's happening in Estonia and Georgia and all over Europe and with the Marine Le Pen in France and mm -hmm. so forth. So the Russians are taking uh, our, our, you know, there, there are no bullets or bombs or boots on the ground, but it's a war nevertheless. 
using uh, cyber warfare, uh, information warfare, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very uh, powerful, these are very powerful weapons. It is, because what they're doing is they're selling oligarchy and authoritarianism to the billionaire class, and then the rest of us are going to have to do something uh, to respond to it, and it could destroy democracies all over the world if people have to duke it out in the streets, and that is their goal. That is really where we're at. I love you, Craig. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I You're welcome. It. Okay, me too. Me too. The book is called House of Trump, House of Putin. It's available on Amazon and all your booksellers. Uh, grab it. Just grab it. I think what I tweeted, I tweeted a link to his Am- to Craig Unger's Amazon page. So you could just go there and read some of the reviews and buy that book. It's awesome. Awesome. Everything that we just covered is in there. Uh, all right. On the other side, I'm going to play you uh, this this uh, little contratops at Davos because the natural end to this story, if if people don't wake up, is that corrupt governments are being sold to billionaires as being their only protection from the people. And if the people have to push back, it'll have to be in the street. The fault. We believe that all men are created equal. To the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. I have a dream. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? Hey. It's a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach Show. Turn up your mind. All right, I want to show you this uh, this little exchange that happened in Switzerland. That's where Davos is, in Switzerland, okay? Uh, they had, you know, that's where they had the World Economic Forum. Uh, there was a Dutch historian and an author. This man studies poverty and global inequality. His name is Rutger Bregman, and he was included uh, on a panel. And the, the, the observation that he had this was his first time at Davos, was that all the people in Davos, in the Swiss Alps, had flown in on 1,500 private jets. These were the world's richest, richest men. And that the elephant in the room that no one was talking about, although they were talking about things like, um, you know, uh, the destruction of the planet, and, you know, these very uh, philosophical, large... Nobody had ever had a panel in Davos to talk to these billionaires about taxes, or more specifically, how the very, very wealthy work so hard at hiding their money, laundering their money, avoiding them, not paying them. So here is what he said, and then I'm going to play you a CEO who responds to him that he ought to just shut up about it. And then I'll play you uh, the response from a woman who has worked her whole life at Oxfam uh, and says that, uh, you know, uh, you talk about employment and full employment. And it's interesting because today the unemployment rate went up, but, uh, you know, the amount of jobs created. But these jobs are not jobs of dignity. These are the low-paying, part-time, you know, supplemental jobs. These are not great jobs, okay? Uh, And so here's how the conversation went. This was really amazing. Okay, so let me give you both a historical... This is my first time at Davos, and and I find it quite a bewildering experience, to be honest. (laughs) I mean, 1,500 private jets have flown in here to hear Sir David Attenborough speak about, you know, how we're wrecking the planet. And uh, I mean, I hear people talk in the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water, right? <laughs> there, was, there was only one panel, actually. Mm-hmm. Well, we've had two. You're the second well, of well, our panels. There, there so was only one panel. Let's go there. One. One panel hidden away in the media center that was actually about tax avoidance. Yeah. I, was about, I was one of the 15 participants. So <laughs> something needs to change here. I mean, ten, 10 years ago, the World Economic Forum asked the question, what must industry do to prevent a broad social backlash? The answer is very simple. Just stop talking about philanthropy. 
and start mm -hmm. talking about taxes, mm -hmm. taxes, taxes. We need to, mm -hmm. I mean, just two days ago, there was a billionaire in here, uh, what's his name, Michael Dell. And uh, he asked the question like, name me one country where a top marginal tax rate of 70% has actually worked. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a historian. The United States, that's where it has actually worked. In the 1950s, during <laughs> Republican President Eisenhower, you know, the war veteran, the top marginal tax rate in the U.S. was 91% mm -hmm. for people like Michael Dell. You know, the top estate tax for people like Michael Dell was more than 70%. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid <laughs> philanthropy schemes. We can invite <laughs> Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. Yeah, that's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is b in, in my opinion. Thank you. So then, the CEO of Yahoo, I'm sorry, the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, because I don't want Ken Goldman to listen to our show and go, I'm the Chief Financial Officer, not the Chief Executive Officer, you Yahoo, right? I don't need that. I don't need it. Ken Goldman is the Chief Financial Officer of Yahoo. And he stood up and said, but you got such a low unemployment rate in the world. I mean, you know, the American uh, economy, we actually reduce poverty around. Nobody talks about the fact that the, uh, us, we are the ones that are reducing poverty and blah, blah, blah. Okay, check this out. We have a tax system that- Oh, I thought you put him in. Oh, he is in? Okay, just check this out. We have a tax system that leaks so much that allows $170 billion of money every year to be taken to tax havens and to be denied the developing countries that need that money most. So we have to look at the business model and we have to look at the role of governments to tax and plow back money into people's lives. I have to say, oh, honestly, is. this is a very one-sided panel. The U.S. basically has the lowest unemployment rate ever, the lowest black unemployment rate ever, lowest youth unemployment ever. Uh, we've actually reduced poverty around the world. No one's talking about that at all. So I'd like for the panel to talk about beyond taxes, which every one of you have talked about. The only thing you've talked about in this whole panel on inequality, mm -hmm. what can we really do to solve and help solve inequality over time beyond taxes? Beyond taxes. Leave my money out of it. Leave my estate, leave my uh, wealth out of it. I, I'm interested in solving inequality as long as I don't have to pay a proper amount of taxes so that developing countries or Americans can have Medicare for all or free public education all the way through to college. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm all for solving the problem as long as you don't touch my wealth. So this woman that you saw at the beginning, her name is Winnie B uh, Bayanyama. She is the head of Oxfam. She studies global inequality around the world. And guess what? She also studies inequality in the United States of America. And she was very ready to answer Ken Goldman's, uh, what else can we do besides taxing? What else can we do? Because I'm not interested in you taxing my money. Gentleman who talked about who said we've just talked taxes and that jobs are there and there's low and unemployment rates are low. Let me tell you something. We're talking about jobs, but the quality of those jobs. And we also work with poultry workers in the richest country in the world, the United States. Poultry workers. These are women who are cutting the chickens and packing them and we buy them in the supermarkets. Dolores, one woman we work with there, told us that she and her co-workers have to wear diapers to work because they are not allowed toilet breaks. Oh my God. This is in the richest country in the world. That's not a dignified job. Those are the jobs we are being told about, that globalization is bringing jobs. The quality of the jobs matter. It matters. These are not jobs of dignity. In many countries, workers no longer have a, a voice. They are not allowed to unionize. They are not allowed to negotiate for, work, for salaries. So we're talking about jobs, but jobs that bring dignity. We are talking about health care. The World Bank has told us that 3.4 billion people who earn $5.5 a day oh, are God. on the verge, are just a medical bill away from sinking into poverty. They don't have health care. They are just a crop failure away from sinking back into poverty. 
They have no crop insurance. So don't tell me about low levels of unemployment. You are counting the wrong things. You're not counting dignity of people. You're counting exploited people. I, I wanna... That was beautiful. I love that so much. That thing has been seen six million times. That thing went completely viral. And uh, she said the, the reason why she's never told this story before about the poultry workers, she said she had long been discouraged from telling it. She said she had been told not to bring it up in front of, uh, you know, political officials or in Davos or in any any organized for because she wouldn't be invited ever again if she started to tell the stories of American workers who are literally working in poultry factories with diapers on or meatpacking plants with diapers on because they're not allowed to take bathroom breaks. She is the executive director of Oxfam, okay? And she said, I, when, when, when uh, Goldman stood up, she said, I couldn't take that. It sounded so out of touch and so insensitive to the millions of people who are just a medical bill away from sinking into poverty. So I had to tell this Davos man, I had to give him a wake-up call and tell him they've rigged the economy in their favor. They are making super profits they're untaxed and they're pushing down wages and taking away workers rights they are dodging their fair share of taxes that's why they're super rich and that's why a handful of people own more than the the 50 percent of the world combined here's the crazy part here are the numbers 2200 people on this planet 2200 people on this planet they are billionaires this is who we're governing for, 2,200 people. Their wealth increased by $900 billion. It's almost a trillion dollars last year. 2,200 people saw an additional almost trillion dollars going to them. The bottom half of the world's population, wealth declined. The richest 26 people in the world own as much wealth as half of the world's population. Let that sink in. And you tell me that this isn't some sort of a business mafia. You tell me that these people, these billionaires, who are all against the billionaire tax. You know, Howard Schultz is against the billionaire tax. Guess who else is against the billionaire tax? Uh, Michael Bloomberg, who's also thinking about running for president. He's against the billionaire tax. Find me a billionaire who's for the billionaire tax. And I'll show you a guy with some sort of uh, integrity intact. That man would be Nick Hanauer. He is the only billionaire that I can find anywhere on social media, anywhere in, uh, uh, in, on a panel, in a forum, anywhere who points out that people who are advocating for the billionaire's wealth tax, meaning not the whole fortune, but the fortune over $10 billion, the, 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 every nickel over $10 billion, be taxed at 70% in order to put money into the societies that allowed them to be billionaires. That that is a centrist view. That is not left wing. That is not radical. That is the most democratic idea ever. Why? Because it benefits the most people and not a fringe group of 2,200 billionaires, which is very fringy. I got to tell you that this man who started this conversation, this uh, a Dutch historian, he said this also at this forum. He said, if we don't solve the problem, they, these billionaires, are going to destroy our democracies. And people will have to solve the problem, and they will do it on the street. 
And Winnie, the woman from Oxfam, said, there is fear because there is an understanding that this is unsustainable. Ken Goldman is one of the 25 highest paid CFOs in the country. Show is live on RandyRoads.com and the free Progressive Voices app for Android and iOS. Visit the App Store or ProgressiveVoices.com now. Social movements are the moral compass and should be the moral compass of our politics. I do think a system that allows billionaires to exist mm. when there are parts of Alabama where, where people are still getting ringworm because they don't have access to public health mm -hmm. is wrong. Yes. The wage gap is an injustice that persists through secrecy. It is time that we pay people what they are worth and not how little they are desperate enough to accept. He's not in the Russell Building, he's not in the floor of the Senate, and 800,000 people don't have their paychecks. Everyone deserves justice and everyone deserves equal protection and prosperity. She's right, and that's what it's going to take. I mean, obviously, the system is so rigged at this point that you have 2,200 people who are literally buying uh, governments. They are literally buying our government. These are the donor class people. They are doing it to protect their wealth because you have people like Elizabeth Warren. You have people like uh, uh, AOC. You have people that are obviously understanding that Bernie Sanders started this whole conversation about income inequality and brought the numbers to light so that we could understand who was interested in keeping things this way and who was being punished inside of a corrupt system. That capital was being taxed less than hard work. Now, we all pay if you own a house. Everybody pays property tax, but they don't want to pay an estate tax. They don't want to pay uh, property taxes after they die. They want it shielded so that they could uh, pass their inheritance on to their ne'er-do-well sons and daughters who live on Palm Beach and drive around all day in Bentleys and sit and bitch and moan that the, uh, you know, the gardener didn't take that yellow leaf off. I mean, this is a sick society. This is twisted and it's all upside down. And the reason is because every time we have a Republican president, he lowers the taxes on these freaking billionaires, gives them our hard earned money, transfers our wealth to them. And the vehicle for wealth transfer, it's not just crime and corrupt and money laundering, which does happen at very big banks across the, 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 the globe. We know that from the Panama Papers. We know that from that consortium of journalists who worked their asses off to show you that this was a corrupt and broken system and that all kinds of work and I mean, the hard work that billionaires do is avoiding taxes. That's the hard work that they do all day. The hard work that we do all day is taxed at a greater rate than the, the moving of the money. It's a sick system. It's broken. It's unsustainable. And like I said, they are going to break our democracy. And the only thing left is a social movement. And that's a sad thought, but that's the truth. That's where we're at. Unless the law can actually be applied to this real estate man who is, you know, all mobbed up and just a criminal. And there isn't really any real estate law to rely on. So we have to hope that there was dirty dealings in the Bank of Cyprus. There's dirty dealings in uh, Deutsche Bank. There's there, that, uh, you know, this one man who we're all looking to as if he has superpowers, Bob Mueller, can fix, can find, can charge. And we don't even know if our system allows for the king to be indicted. We don't even know yet. It's never been tried, tested. But, of course, we've never had a criminal of this magnitude in the White House, ever. We've never had a, a, a money launderer as the uh, Commerce Secretary. We've never had somebody who's equally as mobbed up as the Treasury Secretary taking sanctions off of oligarchs who did this to us. You know, we've never had this before. But I will tell you, this conversation wasn't over that happened at Davos. So you had this historian point out that it's the tax laws that are the big transfer of wealth. It's like an electrical grid, you know? 
where the electricity is delivered through the you know uh, through the, through the circuits and the and the wires. Well, the money is delivered from the treasury through the circuits and the wires that are embedded in our tax code. And the beauty of what Elizabeth Warren is pr- proposing and the beauty of what AOC is talking about is that it wouldn't have all these Swiss cheese loopholes in it. It would just be every dollar over ten billion has to be accounted for and taxed. No loopholes, no way out. And then we could afford to talk about things like Medicare for all. Then we could talk uh, talk about kids who do really well in school who deserve a, a seat in a, a, at a college get there without debt, without graduating with a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt before they even look at their first little cracker box house, which is the American dream. So this Mr. Ken Goldman that stood up and, and, and tried to talk back uh, to, to this uh, historian, he actually, he's one of the 25, this is in uh, the Washington Post. You want to know where I'm getting all this? The Washington Post. It's in the homework today too, this article. It's called An Angry Historian Ripped the Ultra Rich Over Tax Avoidance at Davos then one was given the mic and that one was ken goldman and so ken goldman said uh, you know uh, he stood up and he said oh you know uh and he's one of the 25 highest paid cfos in the country according to business insider um he said i have a lot of friends that said good for you after he stood up and said do you know unemployment is so low in the united states and and, and african-american unemployment is so low and youth unemployment is so low yes but these are crap jobs these are really bad jobs. Some of them are $2 an hour jobs with tips. And they and, and there's a proposal to tax their tips. Oh my God. Their, 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 their brutality is endless. But he said, I had a lot of friends that said, good for you. I wanted to talk about more than just taxes. And you know, it was a panel. And all they talked about was raising taxes. He said this, how do you create good jobs? You need to be educated. I was educated. Everything I got was earned. Nothing was given to me. No hand-me-downs. I earned it. How do I how did I earn it? I went to school. I earned my way up. I can tell you driving an Uber is better than no job. That's his attitude. Just don't tax his money. Here's Nick Hanauer, who's also a billionaire trying to explain the billionaires to us and saying that taxing the fringy 2,200 billionaires is not a a, a fringe position. Any position that benefits the the great majority of people who work for a living or any proposal that benefits the great majority of people over a handful of others is centrist. It is not fringy. The billionaires are the fringy ones. You say Uh, there's something wrong uh, with what Howard Schultz is doing. What is it? Absolutely. I I, I love the conversation you've been having, uh, but I, I I just want to make one point is that You know, it's easy to call what AOC is doing as far lefty, but nothing could be further from the truth. When you advocate for economic policies that benefit the broad majority of citizens, that's true centrism. What Howard Schultz represents, the centrism he represents, is really just trickle-down economics, tax cuts for rich people, deregulation for powerful people, and wage suppression and benefit cuts for everyone else without the overt racism. There you have it, in a nice 30-second nutshell. Tweet that. Retweet that. Tweet that to every working person that you know, regardless of their, uh, uh, I don't care if they're Q anon. Uh, I don't care if they're cult 45 members. That is real populism. What Donald Trump did was con you. He put the con in Foxconn. That man lies. And we all know it. And he is part of this, uh, you know, uh, class of people who will do destruction to democracy itself if it means he would have to pay his fair share or his ne'er-do-well children who will inherit that money have to pay their fair share in order to produce another generation of American 
hopeful dreamers. Don't care. They suppress all of our wages, and they do this when they bust our unions. What is a union? A union is our negotiation. It's our side of the table. It is otherwise, all that's at the table are the Ken Goldmans and the Howard Schultzes, the owners, and the business class. Where is the space for the workers at that table if there's no union, if there's no uh, collective bargaining that appoints and votes for a person to represent them in a negotiation? We don't even have somebody at the table. And you know that old saying, if you're not, on, if you're not uh, at the table, you're on the menu. And as long as that table includes only the owner class, only the, the, the CFOs, only the, 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 the bean counters, only the CEOs, and there is no representation for the most amount of people that could be at that table, meaning the workers, there are so many more of us than there are of them, we're just locked out of the room. So how do we negotiate a fair salary if we don't even get a seat at the table where we can say, you know, it would be really good if you guys would pay for our health care. It would be really good if you guys gave us child care in the workplace. It would take so much money and put it back in our pockets if you would just do those two little things that the economy would roar to four or five percent GDP because 70 percent of everything that happens on our GDP watch is consumerism. The more money that's in our pockets, the better our economy is. And these jobs that people are taking are the jobs without dignity. They are the jobs that 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 people literally hurt themselves doing, suffer doing. I mean, please, people on a on a line wearing diapers because they're not allowed to break a bathroom break? Why? Why is anybody allowed to get away with that? I'll tell you why. Because there's no one at the table to negotiate a simple thing like a toilet break. And as long as there's no one at the table to negotiate a simple thing like a toilet break, then they certainly don't feel compelled to provide you child care. And they certainly don't feel compelled to offer a group policy for health insurance that they can plainly afford. And they certainly don't feel compelled to raise your salary. They shop around the world for the cheapest labor. That's what happened at Foxconn. And the idea that the, 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 the Taiwanese who own Foxconn, Foxconn makes uh, uh, you know, uh, the screens for the iPhones, and the idea that Foxconn didn't understand that while American labor is cheap, there's cheaper labor in the world that they could employ and that they agreed in exchange for us subsidizing the purchase of the land for them in Wisconsin. By the way, the people in Mount Pleasant, Wisconsin, you paid for the land that this Foxconn factory, which is just going to be an R&D factory, it's not going to build anything. It's going to be a research and development factory where they're going to apply for H-1B visas and they're going to get the best and the brightest scientists in the world to go live in Wisconsin to work for them. They're not hiring 13,000 American blue-collar workers. That is a lie. What they wanted was the tax breaks. What they wanted was the subsidy. And they got it from the people of Wisconsin. Scott Walker destroyed the unions and then entered into a bogus deal where he took your city's money and bought land for them and then stood on a stage during his re-election bid for the third time and said he was bringing 13,000 jobs to Wisconsin, which Donald Trump parroted, and then stood on a stage and said, oh, I'm the one that turned Scott Walker on to Foxconn. I'm the one that gave him that deal. I'm the one that brought him that. Just don't you forget, don't, don't you forget I did it. And I have to tell you, I know a lot of governors, some are good, some aren't so hot. Some are really not so good. And, and I want to just tell you, I have to say this to Wisconsin. He ran against me in the primary. He was tough. He could be nasty. Mm -mm -mm. Wow. But he was tough and he was smart. 
But I've gotten to know him well, and he did something that I didn't think would be happening in this country for a long time. I got him set up with an incredible company called Foxconn. I got him set up. I mean... And Terry Gow, the head and the owner and one of the richest men in the world, mm -hmm. they make much of the Apple product. And you know, I've been saying for a long time, it won't be complete until we get Apple. And Apple, by the way, is spending $350 billion in this country, bringing back $230 billion from offshore only because of our tax cut. This is all a lie, okay? This is all BS, okay? And this is what billionaires do. They just whip it out and they see who's got the biggest and who can knock more crap off the table. This is, these are the kind. So I introduced him to Terry. Meanwhile, do you know what happened? Three billion dollars in tax breaks, seven hundred and sixty-four million dollars in subsidies were paid by Racine County in Wisconsin, so that the land would be given to them. Okay, they they bought the land, gave it to Foxconn, and by the time Walker was done with his deal, four point one billion dollars was going to be given for thirteen thousand jobs. I mean, that's like $315,000 per job. Do the math. Nobody was going to, I mean, it was just a ridiculous proposal in the first place. And then all of a sudden, Foxconn says, oh, you have to lower your expectations for exactly what, was, uh, what we're building there and how many jobs. They told us they were going to build LCD screen TVs. They're building nothing. It's the Randy Rhodes Show. To speak with Randy, dial 561-270-3844. That's 561-270-3844. So even at this early stage, the economic benefits of this new plant are being felt in 60 of Wisconsin's 72 counties already. Don't worry, in another three weeks, it'll be 72. Oh, my God. Foxconn has already contracted 27 local Wisconsin companies to begin construction of the main facility. As big as this is, this is just a toy compared to the main facility. And I'm pleased to report that Foxconn intends to build 100% of the factory with beautiful American concrete and beautiful American steel made right here. So important. Our steel industry, our aluminum industry, our solar panel industry, it's all coming back. They're coming back fast. Oh my God. It's such a racket, everybody. It is such a- Conservatism is a racket. Truly. They have hired 178 people. At 13,000 people, it would have cost $315,000 per job. It was never going to happen. But here's what happened. Racine County, okay, Mount Pleasant, the city of Mount Pleasant and Racine County agreed to give Foxconn $764 million in tax incentives. They gave the land, and the state of Wisconsin is committed to paying 40% of the expenses for the plant if ever called upon to do so. $134 million will come from the state's transportation fund to widen and improve the, the local roads near the future Foxconn factory. This is a nonpartisan report from the Legislative Fiscal Bureau in Wisconsin. The Department of Transportation didn't give the Fiscal Bureau an exact estimate for the road work yet, as was requested. But there's a grant request, meaning give us free money from Foxconn. Uh, the application requests $246.2 million in funds for the I-94 project. I-94 is like uh, their main uh, interstate those roads include County KR, Braun Road, State Highway 11, 
Uh, the deputy director of the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional, Regional Planning Commission said, uh, those little roads are going to be turned into state highways so Foxconn can use them. The state has also been pushed to spend an additional $252 million to expand I-94 from six lanes to eight lanes from College Avenue in Milwaukee to Highway 142 in Kenosha. And there's huge shortfalls in the transportation fund, so they have to delay all other projects. All other local road improvement projects. The state is going to cancel all other projects in the state of Wisconsin. They also applied for a $240 million federal grant uh, to pay for the widening of I-94. And your ex-governor, Snotnose Walker, who dis- decimated your union so that you don't have a seat at the Foxconn table or any table for that matter where the CFOs or the CEOs are meeting to discuss your future or taking your money. No, you're not even at the table. He committed almost $7 million to an ad campaign to attract out-of-state residents to Foxconn. Half of the workers, the construction workers, will come from other states, primarily Illinois. That's according to the State Journal. Then there's this small matter of bringing electricity to this land that you bought for Foxconn, Racine. And so the American Transmission Company has announced that it will build a new substation to provide electricity to Foxconn at a cost of $140 million, which will then be charged to the 5 million customers of We Energies in Southeast Wisconsin. So that's like Milwaukee. The project is asking the public to contribute more to Foxconn by paying more to your utility company so that they can build a $140 million substation to power Foxconn. And Foxconn has been exempted from all environmental regulations so they can pollute as much as they want. And then when they do the remediation, that falls on the taxpayers of Wisconsin too to clean up. And... They want now permission to be treated as a foreign trade zone so that they don't have to pay taxes or customs or duties or anything. So the total cost is about $4.5 billion. And the cost of the plant, the whole thing, is 9.5. So you're paying for half of their plant through higher electric bills, through higher taxes, gasoline taxes to fill up the transportation fund so they can, you know, build roads for them to use, through remediation of pollution of your, you know, lakes and streams. Yeah, you're, you're going to pay up front for half, more than half of their entire plant. So far, not only are you paying for half their plant, but... It seems like it'll be so far a $1,774 charge per household in Wisconsin. And that was back when it was only $3 billion. That is what billionaires do. They con you. They con you into paying their way. And then they have the balls to sit there and say, I did this on my own. Everything I've got, I earned. No, everything you got is gamed. Everything you got is gamed. And that's why your companies have lobbyists. So that you can play the game. So that you can game the system. The destruction of unions was to keep us out of the game. Off the playing field. Not even on the sidelines, but out of the arena. That is just the truth. And here is the report about Foxconn 
Well, they're changing their plans. They're not going to create all these jobs. Oh, hell no. And even at $13,000, it was still $315,000 per job. That was ridiculous. One of the world's largest electronics makers is changing its mind about a giant project that the president praised and the state of Wisconsin backed with a record subsidy. Foxconn, based in Taiwan, promised to build a 20 million square foot factory in that Wisconsin you'd pay for. and provide 13,000 blue collar jobs. Well, state lawmakers approved about $4 billion in tax breaks for the mm, company. Mm, mm. In 2017, the president said the project showed that manufacturing jobs are coming back. Here's what he said. One of the truly great companies of the world will build a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility mm -mm. for the production of LCD panel products in Wisconsin, investing many, many billions of dollars right here in America and creating thousands of jobs well, that is no longer true. Huh. Foxconn said yesterday it will now build a technology hub at the site, primarily for scientists and engineers, not blue collar jobs. When this was announced, people who looked at this deal said, I am doubtful there will ever be a return on the public's investment, even if the most optimistic projections of jobs and tax are met. I suspect Scott Walker do not care. They will reap the short-term political benefits, but will be long gone by the time the lack of results start coming in regarding job growth and economic development. And that is exactly what has happened. So enjoy paying an extra $1,774 per household in Wisconsin to pay for Foxconn's smaller R&D hub after you invested and were duped into believing you were creating 13,000 jobs for your state. It's just a lie, and it's always a lie, and that's what lobbyists do. This is like the for-profit education scam where there's no gainful employment guarantee, so you pay $40,000 to attend an online university that doesn't have a campus, and then you get done, and you find out your nursing degree isn't accepted in every single solitary hospital nationwide because you've never touched a patient in your life. You've never drawn blood. You've never uh, you know, uh, uh, taken a pulse on a human being and nobody will hire you, you can't go back and sue that university for lack of gainful employment because they lobbied that out of the creation of for-profit colleges. They lobbied it out. I know this firsthand, I watched them do it. These are the games they play. They did not earn their way to this uh, lofty, uh, you know, perch where they sit there and tell you, be happy you have a job driving Uber. Just be happy. They did not earn this. There are so many loopholes, so many subsidies, so many federal grants, so much of our dollars that go in up front and then on the back end, they tell you, just be happy that we pay you, uh, you know, $7 an hour. Just be happy with it. Just shut up. We created a job. Yeah, but the job requires I wear diapers because I can't get a bathroom break. Well, could be worse. That is not democracy. Okay, that has nothing to do with the American dream. That is a global billionaire arrogant, disgusting, disgraceful system of corruption. And anything that we do to show it, expose it, fight it and beat it is centrist. It is not left wing. It is not right wing. It is not liberal, social. It is justice. It is just. It is right. Wherever there is corruption, a democracy must have justice because freedom is completely and wholly reliant on justice. And I think now 
through today's explanation of how it started in the 80s and how it's continued through today and how oligarchs and billionaires around the world who spirit their money away to offshore havens and avoid taxes and depress the economies of the world, their corruption was exposed from the very beginning of today's show. Thank you very much to Craig Unger. And now you can see its rightfully wrong conclusion. And that is that democracy is not sustainable with this type of corruption undefeated, unanswered, unprosecuted. That is just a fact. We cannot go on like this. And to say that is not progressive, it's not left-wing, it's not AOC, it's not Elizabeth Warren. It doesn't belong to any one person. It belongs in the fact file of what the hell has gone wrong in this country. You want to know why so many people are angry and why so many people have lost their hope and they live in despair? This is the base reason. This is, uh, this is the foundation upon which... All of this inequality was built. And that's just the fact. Teresa in Illinois. Hey, Randy. Hey. You will have the last word before the Super Bowl. Go Rams. Go LA. Shout out to my peeps on uh, Facebook. Woohoo. And I'm wearing my Randy. Um, I just wanted to say. Oh, can I just say this before you. Can I just say this? That is a. No, um, apparently not. A wealth tax. Elizabeth Warren was saying a wall of text, the paintings and stuff like that. And they're like, ooh, ooh, well, guess what? We all paid already, these little beer ponds. And our car stickers, um, here in Illinois, we have to pay a tax on our car. And it depends on how much the car is worth. Of course. And that's how much your uh, tax is. We right. And if, you ha- and if you have a red... Um, right. And if you have a Renoir... Uh, and you have a Picasso, uh, and you have a golden orb, well, when you die, we know what the value of that is. You know how we know? You've insured it for exactly how much it's worth. And so we tax it based on that value. You see what I mean? No loopholes. Every nickel they have, every dime they have, every piece of art that they have, every car that they have, every every piece of property they have has been appraised and given a value and insured for that value. It is very easy to figure out what some billionaire has over $10 billion and to tax it as a wealth tax, not as an income tax, a wealth tax. And that's the difference. Inside the income tax are a bunch of like Mexican tunnels. Swiss cheese is what they call it. I call it Mexican tunnels because that, it, if you if you sliced open the desert between us and Mexico, you'd see nothing but tunnels, okay? It's a billion dollar empire. Well, that's what our tax code also looks like. There are empires, empires of squirreled money. And we need to tax it in order to build our country up. Period. End of story. When she says, when she says, AOC says, how could you allow for billionaires to go untaxed when people in Alabama still suffer from ringworm because they don't have access to public health? Let that sit with you for a while. Listen, thank you very much to Craig Unger. His book is called House of Trump, House of Putin. Go ahead and buy it and grab a T-shirt. Buy a stinking podcast.